morning's scripture, reader, scripture reading will be from 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1, 1 through 7. There was a certain man from Ramathaim, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Panina. Panina had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Panina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Let the church say amen. amen. Let the church say amen again. Amen. And let the church say amen one more time. Amen. amen. I know, I know, that title is a little questionable, right? My husband must be possessed. Wow. In the light of the holiday, I figured this would be a great title for a sermon this morning. I don't know if you're familiar with the story of, of, of Hannah and Elkanah and, and, and baby Samuel and what all transpired, but I want, to, uh, I want to focus on this block of scripture. I want to focus on this story today because there are some very intriguing elements. And a lot of times when we hear a sermon about Hannah uh, and about Samuel, it's just solely focused on them. It's mostly about motherhood, about parenting, and those are great sermons to bring about from this subject and from this text, but I want to focus on Elkanah. I want to focus on the marriage relationship between Hannah and Elkanah, and I believe that he had some very um, um, wonderful characteristics about him that we can relate to to help us have better marriages. Um, and thinking about this title, I know you may be wondering, where does this come from? Well, has your husband, ladies, those who are married, has your husband ever done something so ridiculous? And the only thing that you can think of is, this man must be possessed. Have you ever woke up one day and you realize the man that I married is not the man that I'm married to now? Something is wrong. Something is off. He must be possessed. Well, that's not where I'm going with this sermon at all. (laughs) Sorry. The idea behind the title is that the name Elkanah in the Hebrew means possessed by God. Amen? Amen? Possessed by God. So looking at Hannah and her relationship with her husband, I could imagine her saying, my husband must be possessed by God because of his character, because of his behavior, because of his love for me. And that's what we want to focus on this morning. So I want to bring to you four points, four points. My husband must be possessed, number one, because he leads us in family worship. Number two, my husband must be possessed because he loves me, although, and we'll get to that in just a little while, my husband must be possessed because he makes our marriage a priority in his life. My husband must be possessed because he accepts my influence as a wife who adds value to this relationship. Point number one, 
My husband must be possessed because he leads us in family worship. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, it reads, Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and sacrifice to the Lord. At Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. What does this tell us about Elkanah? That he was a man who saw the value in family worship. Elkanah was a spiritual leader in his home. Well, worship was not just something he went to, but it was something that he did. Amen? There were other priests at the temple. Eli was there. Hophni was there. Phinehas was there. So Elkanah could have easily given his position of worship and sacrifice over to the priests of the temple, but instead he took responsibility to perform the sacrifice and to worship with his family himself. He took responsibility for his family's worship. His family was able to observe him worshiping God. They participated with him in worship to God. He shared the sacrifices with his family, so his worship also involved serving his family. I want to ask the parents today, the husband, the wife, does your family see your worship? Does your family see you worshiping God as a daily part of your life? Do they see you praying to God? Do they hear you singing to God in your home? Do they see you reading your Bible? Do they see you making sacrifices because of the relationship that you have with God? Elkanah's family watched him worship. There are so many men who come to worship but never worship at all. It surprises me that here we are, believers in Jesus Christ, saved by his blood. We claim that we are lovers of God, but when it comes to singing, we're silent. Amen, church. It saddens me that that there are so many parents, so many Christians, who rely solely on the preacher and the youth minister to engage their family in worship. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but if there is no relationship, how can your child, how can your spouse, how can you truly appreciate worship with no relationship? Because the reality is we only see each other once a week for the most part. And when we see each other, it's in a very formal setting. And so there's really no intimacy involved. There's no uh, relationship being established and cultivated. And so worship seems to be somewhat disconnecting from the person up here and you down there. That's why family worship is so important. There's something about the intimacy and the relationship of the family dynamic that makes worship so meaningful when it's done in the home. Think about it. The relationship has already been established throughout the years. The intimacy has already been established throughout the years. The love has already been established throughout the years. It only makes sense that you will worship together as a family. Not only should we come here together in a public assembly to worship and sacrifice to God, but it should be something that we do in our homes. Amen? When a spouse is possessed by God, they will lead their family in worship. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. And it says, And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her. Now this was what Peninnah used to, used to do to Hannah. 
used to provoke her, used to irritate her. It says, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. As a counselor, you know what this screams to me? This says, depression, depression, depression. Extreme sadness. Extreme irritability. So much so that she would not eat. Could you imagine going to worship God and you had this person next to you the entire time from the moment you wake up in the morning in the car, they're provoking you, they're irritating you. For some of you, it's your children. And then you get to worship, and here they are over and over and over again. How could you possibly have a mindset to worship God when all of this is going on? This tells me that Hannah's worship to God was uninhibited by conflict by ungodly people. Let me say that again. Hannah's worship to God was uninhibited by conflict or ungodly people. And I think this is really important because a lot of times people will rub us the wrong way. Amen. A lot of times people will say things to us that are absolutely offensive. There are times where people, even in the church, will say things to our children that are just disrespectful, that are out of line. And unfortunately, when this happens, a lot of people, they leave. They find another church to go to. Or they stop going to church altogether because of what conflict transpired in the church building with another member. But for Hannah, this was not so. She did not allow conflict to stop her from worshiping. So often we allow family conflict, ex- uh, external circumstances, life stressors, financial hardships, and conflicts with other church members to, as an excuse to not worship, to not come, to not engage, to not be amongst the saints. Church worship is not dependent on our feelings or our circumstances. Amen? First Samuel chapter 9, uh, chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. It says, After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, but her lips Uh, She was speaking in her heart, and only her lips were moving, and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be drunk. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. What worship. What sacrifice. Here this woman is, burdened with family conflict, depressed, irritated, aggravated, saddened, crying. Where? In the place of worship. At the temple. In front of the priest. In front of the priest, Hannah showed God the depths of her pain. You know, we often tell people to come to worship You know, come to worship just as you are, right? God doesn't care what you wear. Come to church just as you are. And we say this thinking about the physical aspect, but not the emotional one. Amen, church. 
What if people came to church as they were emotionally? What if they came to church with their eyes full of tears? What if they came to worship and they said, you know, my day is not going well. My week is not going well. My year is not going well. I've been dealing with, with depression, with thoughts of suicide, with anxiety. Things are not going well in my life, but I'm here anyway. How would you respond to that? It seems like we only accept people to come to worship as they are when they're happy or when they're apathetic. When there's no emotion at all. But here Hannah is willing to show herself emotionally vulnerable in front of the priest, the preacher, the elders, the leaders of the congregation. Oh, we can learn so much from Hannah. In worship, we become so self-conscious, worried about how we sound, how we look, trying to not bring attention to ourselves. But that only creates a superficial worship experience. Amen, church? Verses 17 and 18. It says, Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Now watch this. It says, Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Now there's something we need to realize when it comes to worshiping God. Worship changed Hannah even though it did not change her circumstances. Isn't that true? Remember, she came to the, to the priest, to the temple, to worship. She was depressed. She didn't eat. She was sad. She was crying. She was an emotional wreck. But after praying to God and talking to Eli, she changed. She went her way, she ate, and her face was no longer sad. Worship is important for families because worship changes us without changing the situation. Many people use worship to make a deal with God. All right, things are going well in my life. I need some more money. I need my spouse to take me back. Uh, I need a new job. And so I'm going to go to worship, and, and God is going to move in my favor. This was not Hannah's expectation. Remember, she had been going to worship in this emotional state for years, and God had not answered her request. Now, eventually God does, but this was not a deterrent for her from worshiping God. Worship can lift your burdens without lifting your situation. Why is worship so important? Why is worship so important when we are plagued with, with pain, with suffering, with heartache? There's several reasons. There's several reasons why it's beneficial for you to still engage in worship from week to week, to week in spite of your negative feelings. Why? It reminds us that God is near us. The Bible tells me that God is near to the brokenhearted. So how is it that when our hearts are broken, we walk away from him and he's trying to, be, uh, to come closer to us? Why come to worship? It keeps us in fellowship with God, which allows his wisdom to work on our hearts. It opens our mind uh, and our heart to God's love and greater purpose. It widens our perspective of pain and suffering and heartache. It gives us hope. It gives us strength. It gives us endurance. It gives us courage. It provides us with a positive environment, hopefully. And it provides support throughout the lifespan. I think that is one of the most fundamental things about, about worship, about church, that church stays with you from the moment you are born. If you have a godly family, from the moment you are born to the moment you die, you will always have a body of people encouraging you, believing in you, supporting you, praying for you throughout your entire lifespan. Isn't it worth it? Amen, church. Point number two. 
My husband must be possessed because he loves me although. Verses 4 and 5. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, although the Lord closed her womb. Men, husbands, if your wife is depressed, if she's really sad, take a note from Elkanah and just give her an extra plate of food. (laughs) Just give her the cookies and the ice cream. It will bring relief. She'll know she's loved. Just give her seconds. I'm joking. I'm joking. I mean, it kind of works sometimes. <laughs> Something called food therapy for a reason. Elkanah saw that his wife was, was pained, and so he wanted to show that he loved her, so he gave her extra. He gave her more to show her that he, he sees her, that he supports her, that, that he's there with her. But it says, Elkanah loved her, although, although she could not give him any children. Wow, how amazing. But there are some other althoughs that we need to consider. Elkanah loved her, although at moments she suffered with depression. Amen, church. Elkanah loved her, although she was in grieving, although she was sad, although she did not meet his expectations as a wife. Somebody should have said amen. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that, that when Elkanah decided to marry Hannah, there was this expectation that they would have this wonderful, beautiful, God-fearing family only to find out that she could not have children. That did not subtract an ounce of his love towards her. He loved her even though she could not fulfill her role as a wife. Husbands, listen. There are things that your wife will struggle with. Amen? There are times where she will not be able to live up to the standard in which you have set. There are times that in the relationship, she may have been able to do things in the past that she's no longer able to do in the present or will not be able to do in the future, but she's depending on you to love her through that. Elkanah accepted her for who she was, not demanding her to be something or someone that she was not. It amazes me how often people marry an ideal only to divorce the reality. We often marry the ideal only to divorce the reality. So we jump into marriage with this ideal husband or with this ideal wife even though the person that we are deciding the mar- to marry display none of these characteristics. Amen, church. Oh, but, but he has potential. Oh, I know he's going to be a, a, a better man once we get married. Oh, I just, I just know he's going to be a, a great father despite his childhood. We marry this ideal assuming or wishing that our spouse will change once they say, I do. Does that happen? No, it doesn't. If anything, the things which you didn't like when you were dating, you learn to loathe or or just hate once you get married. Amen, church. But the moment our our spouse shows us the reality, who they really are, we don't want anything to do with them. Even though they've always been this person for the entirety of the relationship. Before you said, I do. 
for some reason we ignore it, we assume things are going to change, we assume we can change them, but we don't. The reality is that biology exists, genetics exist, diseases exist, and they, mis- they may disrupt your ideal or change your reality. Your spouse may have been a certain way early in the relationship, but then maybe after she had children, things start to change. Or maybe as they progress through the lifespan, things start to change emotionally and physically. Hannah, uh, Elkanah loved his wife, Hannah, although although she did not meet his expectation. It truly takes a spouse possessed by God to live out those vows for better or for worse, through sickness and in health, till death doeth part. Amen. Number three, my husband must be possessed Because he makes our marriage a priority. Verse 8. It says, And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Some translations say, Am I not more devoted to you than ten sons? So through uh, Jewish history... Uh, they believe, or their uh, historical documents state that Peninnah gave Elkanah ten sons. Ten sons. So let's put that in the context of the scripture. Here Elkanah is talking to Hannah, trying to, to get her out of this depression. He says, look, I've shown you how much I love you. I, I've shown you my, my devotion. I've put you above my children. You know you're more important to me or I'm more devoted to you than I am my own children. I know many of you are probably feeling a little uneasy about this comment. But this is a very healthy aspect to have in a relationship. He was more devoted to her than his children. It is a misplace of priority for a husband to show more devotion to his children than to their mother. Who was your covenant with when you said, I do? Was it with your children or with your spouse? It was with your spouse. So we need to remember that we made vows to our spouse and not our children. Amen? Usually after children are born, spouses tend to diminish their devotion to one another. And they put so much attention on the children that they forget about the marriage or they put it all the way on the back burner. But you got to remember, if things were done the right way, that you had your spouse before you had your children. So your spouse existed before your children did. Am I right? One day your children, they're going to grow up. And in the midst of their growing up, they're going to hate you. (laughs) Then they'll they'll love you again. Then they're going to move out of the home. And then you are here with an empty nest. And then what are you left with? Your spouse. But if you neglect your spouse in raising your children, once the children leave the home, you're not going to know who that stranger is on the other side of the couch. Amen, church. I think I'm right. I think I'm right. I'm not there yet, but I think I'm right. So it is really important for you to invest and to focus on your marriage as you raise your children. Did you not know that children are better off when marital satisfaction is high? 
when marital satisfaction is high, children witness less fighting in the home? Is that not better for the children? When marital satisfaction is is high, it increases security and stability in the home. It decreases a child's anxiety and depression. One of the ch- a child's greatest fear is that their parents will separate or divorce. So if there's a lot of conflict in the home, it leaves the children with the idea, I don't know if my parents are going to stay together. And you don't know how that tears a child up on the inside as they go through life from day to day not knowing if their parents are going to divorce. It's one of a a child's greatest fears. When spouses choose to work on the marriage and create a high level of marital satisfaction, children are not easily able to manipulate one parent over the other. If they see that there's conflict, they're going to play on that. And they'll try to make you pick sides. And they'll pick sides in order to get what they want. The reality is the father-child relationship does not exist independently from the husband wife relationship. The better the marriage, the better the parenting. By doing this, parents enrich their children's beliefs and philosophies about marriage. Think about the marriage you're modeling in front of your children. Would your children want to get married as they observe your marriage? When we model a successful marriage in front of our children, we are preparing them to have a successful marriage when they become of age. Amen? The marriage also becomes a parenting team when there is marital satisfaction. And it happens with me all the time. Not all the time. Sometimes. So when I'm interacting with my children and I say something um, abruptly, or I react instead of respond, and my wife is there observing me, she won't say anything uh, verbally, but she'll give me a look. (laughs) Or she'll just, she'll do something like this. And that signals to me, okay, maybe I need to go back and rethink what I'm saying or how I'm saying it, or maybe I just need to stop and chill out altogether. But if there's conflict in the marriage, those little cues and signs are only going to breed more conflict. And you won't respect your spouse's um, um, influence on the relationship or on the parenting relationship. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. So the marriage uh, becomes a parenting team where each spouse sets up the other spouse for success in the home. Studies show that when marital satisfaction is high, that husbands and wives are more positive and more encouraging to their children. Parents have to intentionally put their marriage first if they want it to last. There's this old song that comes to mind. Diamond and Joshua sitting in a tree. K-I-S-S-I-N-G. First comes... Then comes, then comes the baby in the baby carriage. Isn't there some truth to that? That as a, as a couple, you focus on love within the marriage, and then you focus on the children. Amen. Verse 19, it says, They arose early in the morning, in worship before the Lord. So after Hannah had had this interaction with Eli the priest, she ate her food, her face had changed, her burden had been lifted. It says that her and her husband Elkanah both, they both together rose early and worshiped before the Lord. Just them two. Then they went back to the house in Ramah. For Elkanah, spirituality was not individualized in the home. It was interpersonal. It was interpersonal. His wife was also a spiritual priority in the relationship. I encourage husbands and wives, pray together. Amen? Pray together. Your relationship 
with God. I understand there is a, this independent relationship, this individual relationship, but as, as relational creatures, knowing that marriage is created by God, it only makes sense that we will worship God together as a couple. And it may be uncomfortable at first because it's something you're not used to, but I encourage you, step out of your comfort zone and sing and pray and study the scriptures with your spouse. What could be more romantic? What could be more intimate, more humbling than a, a husband and wife approaching God in prayer? When I pray with my wife, I hear things about her life as she speaks to God, that I would never know just by talking with her. So it really puts you into the mindset of your, of your spouse. You get to see what their worries are, what their concerns are, what their goals are for the relationship, what their goals are for parenting, what their goals are for the family, what their personal, individual goals. I'm not saying you need to pray together every single time you pray, but it should be something that's done as a couple. Number four, my husband must be possessed because he accepts my influence. At 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, it says, Then the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child has weaned, so God answered her prayer, he eventually gave uh, Hannah and Elkanah as son, they named him Samuel, and here they are as they normally do a year, in a year's time. They go back to the temple to worship, and she says, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord to dwell there forever. Remember, she made a vow. God, if you give me this child, if you give your servant this child, your servant will raise that child, and, and I will give him back to you. And here she is living out this vow. And then it says in verse 23, Alcanal, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. One thing about Elkanah is that he supported his wife's decisions for the family. He supported his wife's decisions for the family. She says, I know worship is important, but, but I have a goal. I'm trying to establish our son. He's, he's nursing right now, and nursing was much different than it is today as far as, you know, they had to travel. We're talking about days, weeks. Um, to to, to the temple to worship in very harsh environments where the lifespan was not nearly as long as it is today. Um, Children died a lot earlier. Some wouldn't make it past their, you know, six, seven, eight years old. So it was very crucial for her to protect this child and to wean him. But Elkanah didn't oppose her. He accepted her influence in the relationship. Dr. John Gottman, a researcher researcher on families and marriages, his research shows that there is an 81% chance that a marriage will self-implode when a man is unwilling to share power. Often we have this idea that the man is the head of the house, and that is true. But we think that that means that you're a dictator where you have to tell your husband, I mean, tell your wife, tell your children what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and they must comply or submit to your request. That's not biblical. That's not biblical. Amen, church. And we often take that verse out of context. It says, wives submit to your husbands as the church submit to Christ. Husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church, right? Did Christ submit to the church? Did Christ submit to the needs 
of the church? Yes. Yes. So submission goes both ways. Amen. In another study, a long-term study uh, of 130 newlywed couples, Dr. John Gottman discovered that men who allow their wives to influence them have happier marriages. Who would have thought? (laughs) And are less likely to divorce. We need to realize that our spouse has something valuable to bring to the family. Amen? That our spouse has something valuable to bring to the relationship. Especially if they're believers. God, the same God that is in you is the same God that is in them. Amen? If a husband is is unwilling to accept influence, it it is extremely difficult for him to be influential in the home. As we close, the fruit of a godly marriage is a godly offspring. Elkanah was a godly man, but much is not said about his other wife, Peninnah. And nothing is mentioned about their children. And I believe it's because Peninnah was not nearly as spiritual, as religious, as committed to God as Hannah. Nor did Peninnah take religion or God seriously. And we can tell by the way she treated Hannah. Right? So the children were affected by her lack of commitment to God. We hear nothing about them. And I know I'm reading a little bit into the text. But we do hear about Samuel. Amen? We hear about Samuel. Hannah's faith and her commitment to the Lord and the combination of having a godly husband who was possessed by God produced for them a godly offspring. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 21 and 24. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. So here Hannah is committing to her or fulfilling her promise, her vow to the Lord. It has been researched by Jewish historians that the average time a child was nursed was from birth to three years. From birth to three years. According to much research in human development, A child's uh, personality, 50% of that, is established and shaped within the first three years of their life. And by age five, 75% of their personality is already set in stone. What does that tell us? That these are the most critical years of childhood, of childhood development. So what's the charge as parents? is to make every moment count with our children. Amen? Amen. Make every moment count. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning at verse 4, it says, Listen, Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And he says, These words that I have given to you today are to be on your heart. And he says what? Repeat them to your children. And And he tells us how to do that. Talk about them when you sit down in your house. Talk about them when you walk along the road. Talk about them when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and on your forehead and let it be a symbol for you. And write, on, uh, write them on the door of your post and in your house and on your gates. So when it comes to impressing God on our children, it must first come from the parents. And this, not ha- this doesn't just happen when we come together as a church for worship. It doesn't just happen in Bible class, but it happens throughout daily living. Through the everyday walk of life, of waking up, praying to God, thanking God. The first thing we say in our family when we wake up in the morning, before we even eat our food, I hear my children and my wife say throughout the morning as we get up, thank you, Lord, for waking us up this morning. First, one of the first things that comes out of their mouths. 
when you wake up, when you lie down, there's prayer, there's scripture, there's, there's Bible study. When you walk o- along the road, when you're, when you're just relaxing, when you're in the car, when you're getting groceries, those are opportune times to allow God to, to develop in the lives of our children. Then it says in, in verses 26 and 28, And she said, Oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And then this happens. It says, And he worshipped the Lord there. Who was he? Samuel. Samuel. Between the ages three and five, as he's being dropped off for the rest of his life at the temple, worships God. Where did he learn that? How did he know how to worship God? How did he know when to worship God? How did he know that this was the place to worship God? He had never been there before. It was his The influence of his parents that taught him how to worship. And it happened outside of the temple. Amen? The challenge today is for husbands, even for wives, to be a spouse, to be a parent who is possessed by God. Amen? Amen. The Bible tells us that Once we are baptized, our sins are forgiven. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And then God gives us a gift, right? He gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's how God takes possession of us, through the Spirit. And it's up to us to allow that Spirit to work on our hearts, to work on our minds, to work on our conscience, to work with our values, to work with our morals, to work with our agendas, to shape us into His image until He possesses us. So then we can have our children possessed by God as well. If you're here this morning and maybe, maybe you haven't been living up to your God-given role as a husband, as a wife, maybe you need the church to pray for you, maybe, maybe worship has become difficult for you because of the conflict in your home, the conflict with your, with your spouse, with your family. Or maybe you just need encouragement from the church if you need anything. Now is the time to let us know as you all together stand and sing the song of invitation. Thank you. Gently break my 